Okay, so there's an equation called the Scherer equation, which helps describe how the idea of particle size or crystallite size is related to the peak intensity or in peak shape. So here's, here's our lesson here. For sharp, well-defined diffraction peaks, like, like these shown here, we can apply the share relation, okay? So if particle size lies between 0.1 micrometers and 40 micrometers, we can apply the share equation. And when crystal sizes are large, um, less diffraction occurs. And then as um, smaller sizes are, are found for crystals, we're going to expect peak peak broadening. Okay, so let's let's spend some less diffraction. So that's going to make it very sharp. Okay, so the, the peak width is what we're talking about. Very sharp. And if the crystals become shorter and shorter, so this this one in here, if we shrink that down smaller and smaller and smaller, we're going to broaden that peak and we'll see wider peaks as a consequence. So x-ray diffraction can provide an estimate for the crystallite diameter, symbol tau, via the Scherer equation. Okay, so left-hand side is the crystal size. It's about a, a, the crystal's estimated to be modeled as a spherical structure. That has limits, obviously. And the right-hand side is a shape parameter, k. Okay, so this is a constant. Um, if we consider spherical type crystals, then the shape parameter is one. And if more oblong crystals are considered, this can adjust to about 0.9. Gamma is, of course, the wavelength incident on uh, our sample. So it's specific to the instrument. We saw copper K alpha used a moment ago. And beta here is called the full width at half max. So we have a maximum value and if we go to the half way point okay where this intensity here it ma matches this value here so let me put i and i there to equate that we go to the halfway mark and then we m measure how wide that peak is the width of that peak at half of its maximum is beta Full width at half max is equal to beta. And then we're going to put that cosine of, of theta here. So theta is, of course, the angle um, of the primary diffraction peak. So here we have 2 theta at 47.351. We would input theta in radians into the Scherer equation. Okay. <clears throat> Very good. So up until this point, we've been thinking just of planes of atoms, but as you might remember, there are atoms between certain planes, like in the body-centered cubic unit cell. There's a set of atoms in the middle of every unit cell. In face-centered cubic, there's sets of atoms at the center of every face. And so this sets up some additional um, rules for x-ray diffraction if we consider those sites as well. And um, without deriving the, the set of rules, here's, here's how we interpret it. So for a BCC, a body-centered cubic system, um, we would expect diffraction when... Bragg's law is satisfied, and when the set of planes that we're considering, the H, K, and L values from the Miller indices, add to an even number. Okay, so for example, a 1, 0, 0 plane adds to an odd number, and so this is not satisfying the condition for a body-centered cubic. So we would not expect intensity there. Let's go to a BCC data set and examine if a 100 is present, and it is not. A 110 
set of planes adds to an even number, and so that does satisfy the diffraction rule, and we would expect to see a 1, 0, 0 if satisfying Bragg's law, and so that would tell us where to, where to find it on 2 theta, and we can see that shown there. <clears throat> so in other words, in a BCC data set, the peak intensities, the Miller indices for the set of planes that led to uh, a certain DHKL for Bragg's law, those HKL values should all add to an even number. So 3 plus 1 plus 0, even. 2 plus 1 plus 1, even. If it's odd, we saw that example, we will not find the diffraction plane and the intensity in the XRD. Okay. In face center cubic, the rules um, are similar. However, um, so you see that reflected here, mixed and unmixed is what's used in your textbook. And how we interpret that is that in order for a reflection to be observed for an FCC system, the HKL indices must all be odd or all be even. Okay, so we can look at the aluminum, the, the indices H, K, and L for the set of planes that we're considering for diffraction. They have to all be odd or all be even. So 1, 1, 1, all odd, we're okay. 2, 0, 0, all even, we're okay. 2, 2, 0, we're okay. 3, 1, 1, all odd, we're okay. And so those are the, the rules for a face center cubic system. Okay, um, some additional rules are known for the hexagonally close pack system, which we've uh, touched on periodically. And so we'll just sort of skip past that. Okay, <clears throat> um, so as we start thinking more about the Miller indices for the set of planes that we're considering for our diffraction planes for Bragg's law, um, we've seen that they're involved in satisfying conditions for intensity in our x-ray graphs, our x-ray diffraction graphs. And clearly they must be related to the distance between planes of atoms. And so an equation has been developed for that for cubic systems, as we show here. So for cubic systems, the unit cell dimension A which is, of course, re representing all dimensions of the sample of the unit cell, is the numerator. And if we divide through by the square root of the sum of the squares of those Miller indices, this is how we calculate D. So, of course, our numerator has a dimension in, say, units of nanometers. And if we were talking about the 1, 1, 1 set of planes, our denominator would be 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared is, of course, 3. And so root 3 would be the denominator in this example. And if we knew the A value for the unit cell in question, then we could predict what the 1, 1, 1 uh, interplanar distance would be. Okay. <clears throat> and we saw that in Bragg's Law, we had n lambda is equal to 2 d h k l sine theta. So we now have more understanding for d, so we could input that here and actually express Bragg's law if we needed to in terms of a unit cell value, a, and its h k l values. So some questions may, may demand that strategy. Okay. Um, so let's recall, we've been spending quite a lot of time understanding d and theta. Uh, we saw th lambda is often constant, depends on what radiation we are using to study our matter. And we have n, which is the order of the diffraction. Um, as we saw in our early examples for light on a compact disc, we could diffract to a first order angle, which was the nearest intensities uh, away from our reflection or our source. And we'd expect second order diffraction as well. So that is that is the identity of n. 
And so for most data sets, we consider an n to be one. And in many questions that you'll see, you'll be given this information, what the order of reflection is. If it's not specified, you can assume it's n of one and, and move on. Okay. Okay, so you can see hopefully that the technique is very useful for helping us distinguish between very similar atoms or impact structures of those atoms and even um, ionic type compounds. Here's oxide of iron. So we have hematite, the hematite form, and we have the magnetite form. And their formulae are different. And clearly their XRD patterns the pattern at which the for where we find diffracted x-rays is very different so this is a bit of a fingerprint for a material as you needed if you're tasked with trying to identify a crystalline sample okay so let's take a look at an example here question where we're asked to investigate body centered cubic iron and compute the interplanar spacing and the first order diffraction angle for a 220 set of planes. We're also given the lattice parameter, so this would be A, and here we have the lattice parameter value is 0.2866 nanometers. And we're given the X ray radiation that was used, so 0.179 nanometers is lambda. And we're also told that the order of the reflection is 1, so this is our N value. Okay, so in order to address part A, we need to calculate the interplanar spacing. So our equation for that was d h k l is a function of the lattice parameter a divided through by the square root of h is value squared plus the k value squared plus the l value squared. Okay, so for this question, our numerator is the 0.2866 nanometers. And the denominator is going to be the square root of 2 squared plus 2 squared plus 0 squared. And so our denominator will be the square root of 4 plus 4. <coughs> So root 8, and then our same numerator, 0.2866 nanometers. So notice that I've been able to just work with nanometers directly in the numerator, and I'm going to inherit an answer here that's in nanometers because our denominator is unitless. And so after doing this, you should find an answer of approximately 0 0.1013 nanometers as the distance between two to zero planes. Good. Okay, and then we're asked to find the diffraction angle Okay, so let's tackle that part next. part B. So we have Bragg's law is equal to n lambda is equal to 2d h k l sine theta. We are asked to find uh, the first order diffraction angle. So solve for first sine. So sine theta is equal to n lambda over 2d h k l. Okay, so from our previous um, part A, we have the denominator information now. Uh, first order, so that was 1 times the uh, wavelength used for the 
uh, experiment. So in this case, we're asking to consider 0.179 nanometers in lambda. We're going to divide through by twice the uh, distance between planes for the 2, 2, 0. So we calculated that a moment ago, and that was 0 0.1013 nanometers. <clears throat> okay, so this fraction uh, should be 0 0.884. Notice we are unitless, okay, so not degrees, unitless. So when one is in a unitless outcome at this point, you know that you must handle this at, as radians, okay? So as you take the inverse sine of this, once your calculator is in radians, you will find that theta here is equal to 62.13 degrees um, after converting into radian, uh, from radians to degrees using the fact that um, one degree can be found um, as doing pi divided by 180. Okay. So this is theta, of course. Our x-ray diffraction graphs put this as 2 theta. And so we need to determine the position on this x-axis where this detect where this peak would be. So once we have that, our final step is to simply double it, and 2 theta is going to equal 124.26 degrees, and that is going to tell us the x-coordinate for the expected diffraction intensity peak here. Okay, so uh, t take a minute to try that on your own. Practice your radians to degrees. That was very important in this problem here, and um, that's it. Thank you.